Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Here on this Friday to hit pause briefly on football, to talk a little basketball recruiting, because it's one of those things that I think it kind of been pushed to the back burner. Obviously, once transfer portal season was done, K-State completes the roster. Everybody's like, okay, we can catch our breath now. And you start to think, mm, K-State, the strategy looks like high school recruiting probably isn't going to be that important moving forward. K-State really didn't put a major emphasis on it uh, in the last class. They had two guys they really wanted. They got one of them in David Castillo, and the other, Pat and Gongba, chose Duke over K-State. And that was basically it for the 2024 recruiting class. But recently, we've seen an uptick in how K-State is handling this 2025 recruiting class. There's buzz with a lot of top players uh, in the country, and we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do that, uh, let's again remind people that the Cats are getting ready to go to Ireland. A little over a year away from K-State and Ireland, they are going to go over playing the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. And what better way to start the 2025 college football season than cheering on K-State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd of 2025. And whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure through the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit CatsToIreland.com for more information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So CatsToIreland.com, and they'll have, I mean, I, I've looked, they've got numerous different packages depending on what you're interested in, how long you want to be over there, how you want to experience Ireland, probably uh, good options for people that are either going to be first-timers over there like me or the experienced Irish traveler. Uh, so definitely go check out CatsToIreland.com if you're planning on going overseas next year to watch the Cats and the Clones play in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. College Game Day is going to be there this year, so it'll be interesting if yeah. it is next year. as uh, what is it Florida State versus Georgia Tech this season? Yeah, Florida State, Georgia Tech. So... Uh, you know, classic ACC rivalry, definitely on the level of Farmageddon. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be interested to see how that goes. And Ryan Lackey was telling us yesterday he's going to go over there and get a little bit of a, a preview of what that ends up looking like. So that is football. We, we will talk about that uh, in the very, very near future and discuss it a little bit more. But let's get back into the basketball situation because K-State has had some of these Notable prospects announce K-State is in the final mix, uh, if you will. So most notably, A.J. DiBatza, he put K-State in his top seven recently. Darren Peterson has K-State in his top eight that he's put out. Malik Thomas had K-State in his top seven. Those are all top ten guys. And then Nigel Walls is number 50 in the class. He has K-State as one of his five schools that he said he's trying to line up official visits to. Uh, and there are certainly some others that K-State might be exploring and kind of putting into, into play right here. Um, and you see kind of the notes down there uh, on what might be significant about this. K-State only had one 2024 commit uh, in the class, and then this year still zero, but it's early for basketball recruiting with 2025. Those normally don't really start taking shape until you get into probably September, October, uh, getting closer to their signing day and everything that, that goes with it. So what do you make of this, D.Y.? Is, is K-State a real threat to land this high school talent, or are they shifting their focus back to being involved in the high school recruiting game? And I guess the other thing I should add in there for context for people is that the scholarship limit is going to go to 15 for basketball teams, which means you know right now it's at 13. You get a couple extra, so you don't have to be as smart about how you allocate scholarships even if we think they're, you know, the sport itself is heading in a direction where you don't need to use even all 13, but you can be even more free with it if you're going to be allotted 15. Yeah. I don't really, I'm not putting a ton of stock into the, the, the limit, excuse me, the limit increase right now, just because I think like half of college basketball doesn't use the 13 at this point. Um, we've seen Kansas state a few times not use the full 13. So I don't think that's going to really impact the sport a whole lot. Um, maybe I would say just say maybe it, you know, inspires, you know, 
coaching staffs like K State to maybe take a flyer on an extra project like Moby, right? Think of Moby Kegaruka that they added this year. Maybe you can take another version of him or two and, and basically roll the dice that it turns into a home run. And if not, you know, you'll process him out pretty quickly anyway. So the spot doesn't hurt. So I could see maybe that being the route with the extra spots in terms of the high school pursuit. I don't think it's going to look a whole lot different than it did last year or like even the year before. I think their goal, and obviously it helps uh, take some of the burden off trains for portal recruiting, although that will still be, you know, a giant resource in recruiting. But I think their sweet spot is they want to add like one to three kids each cycle, I think. Um, and probably no more than that. And obviously three being the high number, but probably not a lot of times even hitting that, um, you, you shared it, you know, last year was just David Castillo, even though they also chased Patrick Gongba this year, I think they have like five or six guys they really, really like right now. And I think they want to land anywhere from one to three of them. You had a few guys up there, obviously, uh, Nigel Walls, he's already taken an unofficial visit to K-State. He's a four-star. Then the three five-stars, Malik Thomas, he went to K-State's NCAA tournament game at Madison Square Garden. Um, the Wildcats just need to get him on campus. Darren Peterson, the number three player in the country. I know a lot of people think he's pretty much tied into KU, and that might be true, but it sounds like he's going to visit Kansas State in August. So you, I guess maybe you think you got a puncher's chance if you you know, knock it out of the park on that visit. And then A.J. DeBonta, who the most buzz is probably BYU, but probably, even though he's the number one player in the country, probably a bit more open than even Darren Peterson. Um, so I, I wouldn't rule out K-State's chances with DeBonta if they continue to make progress on that front. And then I would even add Cam Ward. He's a four-star player, I think, in the top 50 on, on three, uh, I believe, from Florida. I think he just put Kansas State in his top 10. He's taking an official visit to Manhattan in September. So um, Nate Ament, uh, another long shot, but another five-star that has Kansas State in the discussion. So I think they have like these five or six top targets that they're really hammering hard right now and hope to land, you know, one, two, maybe three. What what do you think it is that has caused this shift back for K-State then where they they seem to be more of a player? Or maybe it really just comes down to Hey, they're they're starting to find more secure footing, and and Drew and I have talked about this a handful of times throughout the course of them building the basketball roster this coming year. But they've now been able to get to a point where, yeah, you're still going to have a good turnover number from this year. Like Coleman Hawkins will not be here, David Gasson will not be here, Achora Chor will not be here, um, and Max Jones will not be here. But a lot of the other guys they brought in this year. They will play basketball at K-State this year, and as long as nothing crazy happens, they will be at K-State the following year as well. A lot of guys that have at least two years of eligibility, some with three remaining. So you're able to, I guess, have a better rough draft of your roster to where you can say, okay, we know we've got this, this, and this taken care of next year. So we can bring in more of the high school guys that maybe they'll take more time. Maybe you know the high school recruiting takes more – time and resources off the court for the coaches as well, where, yeah, it's fast and furious for the transfer portal stuff, but now it's been refined down to what, 30 to 45 days where these guys have to hit it hard where the high school side, you have to be really confident that you're spending your time wisely because like, if we're being frank about it, K-State probably wasted a lot of time and resources on Pat and Gongba last year. And that's just how recruiting goes. Like you will do that, but K-State ended up not having it work out for him. So is this a product of, for some reason, K-State is more attractive to high school recruits now, or K-State and their coaching staff has decided we're in a good spot with the health of our roster. We can be more aggressive in this category than we were the last two seasons. Yeah, I think all of that probably comes into play a little bit. One, I, th I just think it's timing. When you're in season – and when you're in the NCAA tournament, I know they weren't. And then when you're recruiting the transfer portal, I think for just about any program, I think high school recruiting kind of goes on the back burner, just a, at least to some extent. Maybe it felt a little bit more for Kansas State. 
um, in comparison to prior years, but I think it was really just a product of timing, right? Because you had to put so much energy and focus on the transfer portal, you know, just trying to, and probably trying to squeeze every ounce of, you know, what you had in the bottle for last year's team, that this was the, you know, the past handful of months is the first time you could really direct your concentration to that facet of recruiting or, or those group of prospects. So I think that's part of it too is I don't know. Like I said, I don't think it's necessarily a shift in focus in terms of, Oh, we weren't going to focus on basketball high school recruiting, but now we are. I think they always probably wanted to do it. Now they are because they have the time to do it that they can allocate. And two, they're in the living room or in the door with some really, really good prospects. I think part of that is Jerome Tang's reputation continues to evolve and continues to permeate throughout basketball. I think he's starting to get a very strong reputation. And the other part, I mean, let's make no mistake, they're starting to become very well associated with having a very, very lucrative NIL situation. And that does appeal to some of the best prospects. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to bring that up. Obviously NIL is the, one of the most important things in basketball right now, recruiting everything that goes into that. And K-State has proven that they are set up and in a really good spot with it. And we also know that like they, they are doing it in both football and basketball. They're making a name for themselves. And it, it was really the talk of college basketball when Coleman Hawkins made his decision to come to K-State. And if you think about it in terms of how it's setting up for K-State, if you want to use a comparison and language similar to the NBA or whatever other professional league, but K-State is about to have a, a big free agency you would assume like if everything goes well this year for K-State basketball, the staff is going to have proven, okay, the program still deserves to get this kind of NIL support. So you're going to have that same dollar figure around, you would assume. Well, you're going to have quite a bit of cap space to play with essentially if you're K-State because Coleman Hawkins is going to come off the books. A chore tour is going to come off the books and then whatever else you've allocated to, you know, like Max Jones as a as an outgoing senior as well. But Hawkins and Achor are the big ones that would be in the mix there. And that's going to give you the runway, a pretty long one, to play ball with some of the big programs that are out there. And just like you said, like, it's also not just an NIL thing for K-State. Like, Jerome Tang has elevated himself and this program to a level where even prior to knowing where K-State was playing in the NIL space – uh, K-State was able to start making inroads with these types of recruits. And I think now you have the right equation to kind of add up and give K-State a real chance. So uh, maybe it's just all kind of right time, right place. And, and that's what it's added up to for K-State. The other thing I'll ask you, like when we've heard of K-State's involvement with these high school recruits now, it has been just oh, so-and-so has announced their top eight, their top six, their top whatever. There has not been as much of the consistent, you know, along the way we're hearing information from many different places, and it's coming from somebody obviously outside of just the recruit themselves. Do you think that K-State is moving towards a realm where they think it's better for them as a staff to be more tight-lipped about the operation that's going on inside the ICE Center? And then that way – you know, it's it's not being heard by people or other members of the industry that are going to share it with others. Like, they do they see more of a benefit to kind of keeping things under the under wraps and striking in darkness, essentially. Yeah, I don't know that you can draw those connections. Like, I well, I'll put it this way: I don't know if it's actually true when you stay quieter that things tend to work out better for you. But I think because they went that route on a couple of guys and it worked, that they've kind of just stuck to that game plan. So I I don't know if it's exactly one plus one equals two, and it might be just more of a coincidence, but because it was a system that tended to breed success, at least when it came to the transfer portal, I, I don't think they're going to shy away from that strategy moving forward. And um, and, and, and because... I think every staff probably is starting to go to this way a little bit more because 
I think with NIL, recruitments are more volatile and more subject or more susceptible to wacky twists and turns and some very late changes that even when you omit confidence and it's correct, you could still be incorrect at the end of the day. So I think it's the volatility kind of of recruiting kind of almost encourages you to want to operate that way. So that's, that's what I would say, but I, yeah, I think it's a combination of Kansas state right now. Um, when it's starting to get in the door of these top programs, I think it's, like I said, Jerome tanks reputation and that continues to evolve and improve and, you know, have really good things like, uh, recruits know who he is like name value name recognition and just a reputation for development is starting to become greater even after you know not advancing to the ncaa tournament and i mean folks still remember what he did in year one at kansas state when he took him to the elite eight and i think Keontae johnson and marquise noel still resonate pretty well with a number of recruits that remember that run and remember how good those two were they were all americans that's a good selling point you put that on top of, you know, you kind of made the big splash in the transfer portal. You got some big names. So now you're going to be one of the teams that a lot of people want to watch to see how it works. And it could result in a very, very big year for Kansas State on, you know, the basketball front. And NIL is not a problem. Now you have to sustain that NIL year after year. And, and, and every program probably has to keep that in mind. Like, how do we continue to have this kind of monetary help year after year? And, if it's sustainable, if it's not, but if it is for Kansas state, they're obviously going to be one of the leaders in that department. The, I wouldn't say issue, but the next step would be how do you manage that in a locker room? Because this is probably something that none of them have had to navigate before. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it goes down, but uh, really just a, a unique situation right now for K state where it seemed like, Hey, maybe it was going on the back burner. I know I was on the game. I think it was last week on, on K man with Mitch and the guys and, he was talking to me about, you know, Malik Thomas and and all this other high school recruiting. I was like, I don't know. Like my vibe at that current moment was I'm not fully buying into it. I don't know, but the steam has certainly picked up over the last week and a half that K State's going to be a player in high school basketball recruiting for 2025. And it's not just for the sake of taking guys, it's because they are going to be in the doors and working to get some of the best players in the country. So that will do it for us here today. If you want more on K-State recruiting, football and basketball, go to On3, find kstateonline.com, and uh, let us know in the comments below what you think of K-State's recruiting strategy, if you think they actually have a shot at some of the top-end talent uh, that they are targeting right now, or maybe you think it's it's a lost cause and a waste of time. You're so soured by the Ngongba thing last year. Uh, I'd be interested to know how K-State fans fall on that one. So, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching K-State Online. We'll be back again later this week with more on the Wildcats.